my name is Eric Vallejos. I'm the Public Information Officer for Northwest Mosquito and Vector Control District. I'm also the Training and Certification Chair for the Mosquito Vector Control Association of California. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Nimala with CDPH. He's a Senior Public Health Biologist. Um, go ahead, Mike, take it over. All right, thanks. All right, welcome everybody to Category C Review Session. This is, as an entomologist, this is my favorite session, my favorite uh, section, rather. So let's uh, enjoy this and have some fun. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna talk about human lice. We're gonna talk about bugs, kissing bugs and bed bugs, cockroaches, hymenoptera, so the yellow jackets, hornets, wasps, and bees, ants, flies, fleas, and then finally spiders, scorpions, mites, and ticks. Okay. So the viewing of this webinar should not be considered as a replacement for studying the category C material in its entirety. So I've summarized the more important things, but they may not uh, be all on this uh, summary here. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about human lice. Okay, know the common names. It, it's helpful to know the Latin names, but really know the common names, head lice, body lice, crab lice. So understand that they're ectoparasites, so that means they live on the outside of the body. And there are three, uh, excuse me, two species of human lice in three forms, the head louse and the body louse, which are the same species, different subspecies, and then the crab louse. So lice thrive in crowded environments, so prison, refugee camps, and that sort of thing, or within groups of people who don't observe hygienic practices, like the homeless or children. Lice are host-specific, so a bird louse can't persist on humans. They still can bite, but they won't persist. So head lice are pediculus humanus capitis. So they're found mainly on the head. The adults are hard to detect. You have to look for the nits. Um, they bite, the bites on the scalp irritate the host, especially on the back of the neck or behind the ears. And if any of you are parents out there and have had uh, children of lice, you'll know that they're very aggravating and hard to get rid of. Um, School-aged children are often infested. Sharing of hats, because they share hats and combs, etc. They have head-to-head -head contact. They're annoying and embarrassing, but head lice don't vector any diseases to humans. And this is where they... Let me go back here. And this is where the expressions like nitpicking and that sort of thing comes from because to actually look through someone's hair, to look through nits, it really is, as the expression goes, using a fine tooth comb. It's really hard to find them. And they're usually about a maybe the eighth of an inch off the scalp and the base of the hairs. The body lice are pediculus humanus corporis. So again, same species as a head louse, but different subspecies. They do not live on the body, despite their name. They live on the clothing seams and visit the body for blood meals. If anybody of you have worked with homeless outreach, as I have, you'll see that uh, the people with body lice scratch themselves bloody and raw. So chest and, and that sort of area is very really common to, to see multiple scabs. Infestation is due to the sharing of cramped quarters and perpetuated by a lack of uh, clothes washing. So common among homeless, refugees uh, during that time of war, et cetera. They do vector human diseases. They vector typhus, rickettsia prowazekii, which if you rank diseases and impacts in history, typhus is one of the worst diseases affecting humankind through history. Trench fever, Bartonella quintana, and relapsing fever, Borrelia, recur interests. Now, note the genus Borrelia. That's the same genus that uh, causes Lyme disease and also tick-borne relapsing fever. Then there's Theris pubis. So it's usually found in the groin and the source of infestation is usually through intimate contact, but not always. It can be spread through in overcrowded uh, conditions. Crab eyes do not vector diseases to humans. So case in point, when I was in the Marine Corps in boot camp, crab lice were actually spreading throughout the squad bay. No, I never caught them, but others did. And it wasn't through any intimate contact. It's the fact that everybody is living very close to each other. So you can have transmission in jails and that sort of thing that has nothing to do with intimate contact. Okay, going from lice, let's go to bugs. 
know the scientific names for kissing bugs, um, common for the bed bugs, okay? So the general rule is all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. So a bug is actually a particular kind of insect. And to be considered a bug, they have to have a piercing mouth part. So bugs are notable, as I said, for the piercing proboscis. And you can see I've drawn an arrow on the uh, kissing bug here on the bottom of the page. So bugs are in the order Hemiptera. And so they have nymphs, meaning that they have incomplete metamorphosis. So as soon as the bug hatches out the egg, except for growing wings later, they're going to look exactly the same as the adults. Examples of medically important uh, bugs are bed bugs and kissing bugs. So kissing bugs are in the family Rediviidae, but that family is spread, uh, split between assassin bugs and kissing bugs. Assassin bugs are not medically important. And one way you can tell the difference is if you look at the two pictures at the bottom of the page, so on the left-hand side, that is the Western Corsair bug. That, that is an assassin bug. If you look at the, the what you'd think of the neck of the bug, see how it's thickly attached to the body? Whereas you have the kissing bug on the right side that has a narrow neck. And that is one way you can just tell in a, in a glance that uh, the two are different. So in California, Tritoma protracta is the most important species of, of kissing bug. There are others, but uh, Protracta is definitely the most important. And they are ectoparasites of wood rats, so neotoma, and colonize their nests. But they will readily bite people if given the opportunity. And they do enter buildings, uh, but they don't typically colonize buildings. May occasionally produce offspring inside the homes, but you're really not going to have the cycle of mating and, and nymphs and what have you developing inside your house. Kissing bugs can vector Chagas disease, which is Trypanosoma cruzi in Mexico, Central America, and South America. So accordingly, um, or fortunately, locally acquired Chagas disease is extremely rare in California. We've only had one confirmed case in the state in 1982 in Tuolumne County. There have been a few others that uh, have been questionable, but as far as I know, that's the only confirmed case in California. And primarily that's because Tritoma protracted doesn't defecate near the host. The way T. cruzi infection works is the bug in South America, for instance, will bite. And as it's feeding, it's defecating all the while. And so if you were to take your hand in your sleep and rub your eye or rub the uh, bug's feces into the wound where it bit you, then you can become infected that way. But T. cruzi is present in California. It circulates through vector wildlife and domestic dog populations in south, southern U.S. And uh, about 55% of uh, 1,510 tritoma of six species submitted to the public across the USA were infected with T. cruzi. I've collected many a kissing bug in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada uh, in Calaveras County. And something like 86% of the bugs I collected were actually positive for T. cruzi. But again, it's the behavior of the bug as they're feeding that makes sure that we have um, only rarely documented cases of T. cruzi. Now, tritoma bite sensitivity is the primary public concern in California and the USA was estimated between 5 and 50% of bite victims experiencing severe bite reactions. Sensitized individuals can try to minimize exposure by making them home less attractive. So if you have a mercury vapor lamp outside your house, you can try changing that and to bug proof of the house. So make sure you practice exclusion. So in tight window screens, tight fitting doors, uh, but severe cases should uh, consider relocation away from rural suburban properties. Um, that's not to say we don't have T. cruzi in humans in California. If people have immigrated from Central America, South America, or what have you, it's entirely possible that they're carrying the bug with them. So it's not unheard of to have T. cruzi detected in, in blood donation samples. Bed bugs, uh, the common bed bug is a wingless and flattened oval shape. It changes from a dusky red color to more uh, vivid red when actively feeding. They're approximately the size of a sesame seed and uh, bed bugs are blood feeders. 
So they do not vector disease to humans and they're a nuisance, but they're, they can be a very bad nuisance. The bites can cause allergic reactions and secondary infections that can result from scratching and they're active at night. Signs of infestations, you have blood spots on the bed, particularly at the edge of the mattresses, they look like little brown spots. Heavy infestations that have a musky kind of stink bug like odor. And bed bugs are spread by uh, bringing in infested clothing, bedding, furniture, suitcases, etc. In bad infestations, they can also walk down the hallway from apartment to apartment or go through the wall. Bed bug control and management. So good sanitation practices are important in the prevention of bed bugs in the home and the sleeping areas. Some infestations can be prevented by washing clothing and bedding immediately after returning from a trip. And it's not advisable for you to bring in beds, used beds, box springs, sofas, upholstered chairs, and that sort of thing into your home. But if you do, inspect uh, things closely for signs of bed bugs. Okay, now that we've gone over bed bugs and kissing bugs, let's go over cockroaches. Okay, know the common names for cockroaches. You don't need to know the scientific names. But you should know where each species is found, indoors or out, in preferred habitat. So cockroaches are semi-social insects. They aggregate clusters guided by pheromones, deposited directly or indirectly on surfaces by nymphs and adults. They aggregate in groups and cracks and crevices in other protected places, usually near food and water. They hide during the daylight hours. They may proliferate under conditions maintaining buildings, and the term domestic refers to cockroaches living within structures. So within structures are domestic. They are not domestic if they live outside. Obligatory indoor species usually develop in occupied places where large quantities of food and water are available. So in other words, the German cockroach and others aren't going to be in an abandoned building because there's no food there, there's no water there. Some species gain access to buildings from sewer system lines and manholes, subway tunnels, storm drains, or masonry meter boxes. Cockroaches can proliferate anywhere where there's a moderate temperature and humidity and adequate food and water. Nymphs and cockroaches, excuse me, adult cockroaches have the same food and shelter needs. Again, they're they they're have an incomplete metamorphosis. So as soon as the roach hatches out of the, the egg, they're gonna look exactly like the adult, except for the, the presence or lack of wings. And that actually makes your life simple if you have roaches because they're looking for the same thing. If you think about butterflies and moths and whatnot, the food for the adult and the food for the larva are two different things. Whereas cockroaches, it's the same thing. So if you're gonna get the adults, you're also gonna get the nymphs. Just keep in mind that the egg case of a cockroach is called an uthika. Okay, I made this little chart for you, a little cheat sheet here. So you can know what's indoors and outdoors. So the species we're gonna cover are German cockroach, brown banded, oriental, American, Smoky Brown and Turkestan. The brown banded and German cockroaches are indoors. The oriental roach is outdoors. And I say mostly for uh, outdoors for the American Smoky Brown and Turkestan because they will enter your house and they will be seen in your kitchen, what have you, but they're not there. They don't really reproduce inside the homes. Uh, the German cockroach is by far the worst pest indoors, and they prefer confined areas, cracks and crevices, and they're found mostly in kitchens and bathrooms with its food and, food and humidity. The brown banded is, uh, they prefer ceilings, upper rooms of houses where warmer temperatures prevail. The oriental cockroach is, uh, prefers uh, cool, moist environments. The American cockroach prefers sewer systems, smoky brown. If, if it's in the home, it can be found in heated areas. And the Turkestan, especially here in California, well, maybe in my neighborhood, um, they're a fairly recent arrival. And uh, they will enter homes, uh, search for food and moisture, but they're typically an outdoor cockroach. And that's why I say mostly outdoors.
Okay, all domestic uh, species of cockroaches have uh, pest status by virtue of being an offensive nuisance. Some are associated with filth, transmission diseases, and inhaled allergens. Domestic cockroaches often live in close association with bacteria, fungi, and viruses and should be considered potential public health pests when they invade or become established. They don't vector diseases like mosquitoes, but they can mechanically transfer filth from contaminated to clean areas. So in other words, if there's some noxious thing on your floor, you know, cat poop or, you know, whatever, and they run up on your counter and get in your food, they can, they can transmit the bacteria and viruses from what they ran through onto your food. In other words, just mechanical transmission. And their presence is usually indicative of poor sanitation. Domestic cockroaches usually live near food and people, so it's best to prevent from getting initial access to these places. Preventing continuous invasion or suppressing established infestations usually involve long-term uh, program surveillance, exclusion, improved sanitation, management practice, and chemical treatment. Once cockroaches become established, insecticides alone have a uh, little long-term effect unless accompanied by improved sanitation and structural upgrades. Also, if you just, as an aside, if you get Amazon packages or you get packages from elsewhere, just be careful because there have been instances where uh, hitchhikers have come with the box too, and uh, you don't want to get into those little friends, friends into your house. Cockroaches can't survive without food or water, so food scraps can be clean, should be cleaned up. Garbage should be placed in containers with tight-fitting lids. Dirty dishes should be cleaned. Opening that allow cockroaches to entrance should be caulked or sealed. Doors, windows, and screens should fit snug uh, tightly. And as far as caulking the cracks and crevices, that'll probably keep ants and other vermin out of your house too. And it's uh, particularly important to keep cockroaches out of commercial buildings, apartments, and other sites where they may establish infestations. Since they do like to congregate or aggregate, that makes them vulnerable to so-called search and destroy missions, such as uh, direct sprays and vacuuming. Um, you can remove cockroaches with a high velocity uh, vacuum cleaner equipped with HEPA filter. And this technique may be appropriate in repetitive maintenance sections where absolutely no chemicals are permitted. Some sprays and powders are designed to be applied in the cracks and crevices where they provide for uh, control for long periods of time. And traps are available, or sorry, effective for detection where baits are safer and easier to, to use. So while we don't recommend sticky traps for mice, for instance, if you do put sticky traps down, on your garage floor, kitchen, what have you, uh, to see what's running around at night. You can catch roach, roaches on the sticky traps and they'll tell you what's, what's uh, going bump in the night. Okay, now let's go over Hymenoptera, the wasp, hornets, and yellow jackets. First and foremost, you should know what bait they respond to, whether it's meat, chemical butyrate lures, or neither. You should know where they prefer the nest, and what sort of habitat they prefer. And you should know the scientific names of the yellow jackets and hornets. Common names will only confuse you. And here's an example. So the common names of Dolica vespula are both yellow jacket and hornet. So D. maculata is the ball fade hornet. D. arenaria is the yellow aerial yellow jackets. Note that uh, true hornets, which are in the genus Vespa, they're natives to the old world. Vespa crabro was introduced into the eastern U.S. and Vespa mandarinia, which has got all kinds of news being called the murder hornet or the giant hornet. It was detected in Washington and Canada in 2019. We're not sure if it's eradicated. Vespa have not been detected in California, so we will not be covering those in the category C materials. So to make things worse, Vespula are also called yellow jackets and sometimes called the ground yellow jacket. So with all those cases in, in mind, it's best to use a scientific name so you won't be confused. Okay, let's start with the Dolica Vespula. There are two important species in California, the first being Dolica Vespula maculata, which is the bald face hornet. And then the second one is Dolica Vespula arenaria, the common aerial yellow jacket. They create large above ground nests, uh, 
basically out of paper mache, and they often can be found hanging from tree branches or the eaves of the building. Maculata can be a summertime pest species at times, but they are beneficial, so they prey on soft bodies insects such as flies. Arenaria is not a pest species, but will defend its nest, so if you are foolish enough to mess up its nest, you may pay the price. Okay, so Vespula are the ground yellow jackets. So they generally nest on the ground in abandoned rodent burrows, holes, cracks, etc. They are very territorial and will vigorously defend their nests. Yellow jacket workers are medium sized insects with a body length of about half an inch. There are 13 species of yellow jackets in the Western United States. And keep in mind that only the females, which are the workers and queens, can sting. So let's go over bait preferences. So Delica vespula arenaria aren't attracted to meat bait or chemical butyrate lures. Maculata is only attracted to meat, but not butyrate. Atropellosa, both, both meat and butyrate. Germanica, only meat, not butyrate. Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania, excuse me. Meat, meat bait, yes. Chemical, yes. Sulfurea, no and no. And vulgaris, yes and no. Sulfurea is a very beautiful little uh, yellow jacket, but they're not a pest species, so they're probably not going to be a problem in your area. Closely related to yellow jackets are the paper wasps. So polistes. These wasps are generally considered economically beneficial, but are well known for their patients, uh, excuse me, uh, painful stings. May become a nuisance by the presence near human habitation or activities. So I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with uh, the European paper wasps that builds e uh, nests in the eaves of your home. Fortunately, they're not terribly aggressive, but if you are unlucky or foolish enough to uh, encounter them, they, they do sting painfully. The nest consists of a single comb without an outer covering, often under the eaves, and they feed on soft-bodied insects and on fruit juice. So hymenopter significance to the public health. The sting is primarily used against vertebrates as a defensive weapon. The venom injected by the sting consists of, of uh, one or more components that can cause intense pain and local tissue damage. And that is called, when you're stung, it's called envenomation. Hymenopter venoms contain a number of compounds that cause a variety of responses, including allergenic and non-allergenic reactions. Normal reactions of the venom following a sting include immediate pain and local swelling. In moderately sensitive persons, reactions can vary and appear in the form of widespread swellings or hives, wheezing, faintness, dizziness, and vomiting. A small person, the or percentage of the population is highly allergic to hymenopter venom and may develop anaphylactic shock following even one sting. If you're working with nests, remember to dress appropriately, boots, heavy overalls, heavy gloves, veil, etc. If you are resorting to the chemical control, read the label thoroughly and follow the instructions. Determine the product that suits your needs. Wasp control can be categorized in three general ways. A nest that's located and accessible, treat at night. Infestation of a small area, treat with the correct bait. Infestation of a large area, conduct a long-term poison bait program. Okay, now that we've gone from Wasp, let's go to the other social insects, the honeybees. Okay, European and Africanized honeybees know the common names. Both European and Africanized honeybees are both Apis mellifera, so you don't really need to know the scientific name. Africanized honeybees are known as killer bees. They're a hybrid between European honeybees and African honeybee subspecies. They're no more venomous than European honeybees, but they're far more aggressive. They're easily disturbed. Africanized honeybees will follow marked targets up to a quarter of a mile, if not longer, and European honeybees usually stop after 50 to 100 feet from the hive. Africanized honeybees swarm more often than European honeybees, and this process is called absconding. 
Africanized honeybees and European honeybees uh, stings can bring on anaphylactic shock. Injected uh, epinephrine can relieve the symptoms. Management control, there's no, no method of uh, controlling Africanized honeybees without harming European honeybees. And be uh, vigilant for bees exiting tree holes, cracks and walls, holes in buildings. If you detect a hive, call a professional to remove it. Do not do this yourself. Africanite honeybees in California are usually from feral colonies and they're more common in the Central Valley, but have been discovered as far north as Napa County. Okay, now let's go to ants. Okay, ants are also, along with the wasps and bees, orders of uh, members of the order Hymenoptera, and they're closely related to the wasp. They are social insects, and they're broadly divided between the two segmented waste wasps, which were the fire ants, harvester ants, and the one segmented waste wasp uh, ants, excuse me, uh, which are the Argentine ants. So Riffa, the red and ported uh, fire ant, very aggressive, it will defend their uh, nest vigorously, prefer irrigated areas such as golf courses, sod farms, and orchards, consumes gr uh, nesting ground life, uh, uh, wildlife, excuse me. If uh, any of you come from the south, you'll be very familiar with Riffa, where they make huge nests along besides trees and telephone poles and that sort of thing. And they can sting and bite both, and they're very painful. The California harvester ant has the most painful sting, allegedly. I have never uh, have discovered that firsthand, so, but that's what's been written. Occurs in pastures, fields, and yards, and almost never invade homes. They forage for seeds. Then the Argentine ant, which is unquestionably the most uh, important pest species. They thrive in urban and suburban environments, multiple queens, so each colony has multiple queens, which is called polygyne, um, and they will form extremely large colonies. So if you ever watch your Argentine ants invading your home, often the queens are coming with them, and you can kill 10, 20, 30 or more queens, and it won't really make a difference. Ant control by, is species specific, so each species has different dietary needs, which will affect the product used. But in general, to effectively eliminate ants, the poison must be given to the nest site. To do so otherwise, um, the treatments are just cosmetic. Okay, now let's go to flies, which are my particular field of expertise and interest. So you need to know the common names. And fly biology is very diverse. So scavengers, predators, parasites, terrestrial, aquatic, semi-aquatic, the flies are all over the map. The larvae feed on feces, carrion, living tissue, rotting vegetation, et cetera. And if you look at the mouth parts of the adults, that often tell you about a species of uh, basic needs. They have complete metamorphosis with four life stages. So egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Although it's important to remember that some species of flesh flies avoid the egg stage. And they have, they give, essentially give quote unquote birth to the larvae and it's called larva positing. And often they, you have to be careful when you're having like picnics or what have you, because they will deposit larvae directly on your hamburger. So they, they skip the state egg stage altogether. And the development time of uh, each, uh, stage is temperature dependent. The larvae and adults typically require different foods, so there's little or no competition between the stages. You need to know the biology of each fly mentioned in the study material. So punkies or noceums, they're painful biters. If anybody's been bit by the noceums, you'll actually remember because they are very, very painful. The larvae develop in clay soil and tree holes and standing water, etc. Black flies, which I'll call buffalo gnats because they have the humped, their, their thorax has a humped appearance. They emerge from running water, which is the opposite of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes do not like running water. Crane flies, they're, as the picture in the upper left-hand corner shows, they're harmless, but they're often mistaken for mosquitoes. They're called mosquito hawks and mosquito eaters, but many species as adults don't even feed at all. 
They're there just to mate, then die. Blowflies. So many species, they feed on carrion. They're also involved in meiosis. And typically these are the, the green bottles and the blue bottles. So any of the large flies that you see that have the, the shiny green or blue appearance, that's almost certainly a blowfly. There's also a lesser house fly, which breeds in bird and animal droppings, and they can be a pest at poultry farms. And the house fly, which is also, along with the mosquito and the louse, is probably one of the, uh, the worst enemies of mankind over time. They breed in rotting vegetation uh, matter and um, vegeta vegetal matter and animal feces. They're pests in homes and farms and they're capable of vectoring bacterial and viral diseases and even helminths, actually. So basically like worms. The stable fly, the larvae feed on decomposing organic material. So you'll see those in compost or like if you pile up uh, grass clippings, you'll often find the larvae in those. And the adults are very painful biters of man and animals. They look basically like a house fly, except they have a proboscis sticks out in front of them like a little, like a dagger or a spear. And the red tail flesh fly, they larvae deposit on fecal material. As I said before, each species mouth part is adapted to their food source. So larvae and adults feed on different uh, substances, allowing for a partial or partition of resources. So they could be liquid from partially digested solids. So blowflies, for instance, will actually vomit on your food. And then the stomach acids will start breaking down whatever it is that uh, they, they vomited on. And then they use their tongue-like uh, tongue, their sponge-like tongue to uh, suck up all the juice. They can feed on blood, such as the stable fly and the long uh, dagger I just mentioned, or nectar and pollen like the bee fly. For medically important flies, uh, many species are, are important to man or animals. So the blowflies that I mentioned before, they're also involved in myiasis. And there's facultative and obligatory myiasis. So basically, facultative means they can go into, like, say you had a wound, or they can go into a rotting animal where obligatory blow uh, animals such as a screwworm fly, they have to go into flesh to reproduce as part of the, the, their life cycle. There's also sand flies with vector leishmaniasis, which in California at least isn't a big human population or excuse, human problem, but it is in dogs. And we just had a case in Southern California affecting a dog. There's black flies, so they spread onchocerciasis in Africa. And there's house flies that I mentioned before that transmit bacteria, viruses, and worms. And the meiosis where they feed on human tissue, and that can be internal. Say if you drink a, a larva, a larval fly, and they get into your stomach, or if you eat food that has larvae in there, or it can be that they're affecting a cut or a scrape on your, on your arm or somewhere on your body. And myiasis can actually be beneficial in some situations where um, the maggots are eating the necrotic tissue and leaving the live tissue alone. Sometimes they do get into live tissue, which is negative, of course. Depends on the situation. Okay, myosis that I've already talked about some is the invasion of one or more diptera larvae in or on a living vertebrate's body where they typically feed on tissue, fluids, blood pus, et cetera, or ingested food. They falls into three different categories. So there's obligate. So living tissue is required in order to fly to complete its life cycle. So that's like bot flies, screwworm flies. There's facultative, it's semi-specific. So flies that refer an environment such as uh, carrion, necrotic tissue, or decomposed organic matter, um, such as blowflies, which is also can be called opportunistic. And then there's accidental. So if you ingest food, water with eggs or maggots in it. Now, prevention is always the best. So don't forget how flies make a living. So source reduction is a key. So Obviously, if you have a dead animal in or near your home, you're going to clean it up or bury it. 
you should, uh, if you have a dog in the backyard, make sure that the feces is picked up as often as possible. You should uh, make sure that your garbage is in tight fitting plastic bags within a tight, uh, that goes inside a tight fitting garbage can. And any sort of debris or rotting material should be cleaned up as, as often as possible. You can also install fly barriers. So when you walk into a grocery store and there's that jet of air that uh, goes down in front of you, that's called an air, air door. And then again, make sure that your window screens are intact. And you should also educate the public on this as a technician, because of course you want them to do your job for you. So if you can get them to, to clean up any debris or fecal material laying around their home, especially dead animals, then you know by all means do so. Garbage is a major uh, urban fly source. So, and not many people value the garbage man. He's the least appreciated civil servant, but uh, prevention, it, this is the prevention of larval habitat. So if he can haul away your garbage and take it to the, the dump, then in a closed plastic bag, then all the better for your neighborhood. Okay, let's go on to fleas now. You should know the scientific names of fleas. And you know that they're ectoparasites and they leave the host to lay their eggs and nest in bedding. The flea larvae look like maggots. They do not feed on blood, but instead feed on the adult flea feces and on bedding detritus. So any sort of like skin flakes or hair, or, you know, any of that kind of nasty stuff that's down in the cracks and crevices of your dog bed, for instance, that's where you'll find the flea larvae. There's cat fleas, which is uh, Tenocephalides uh, uh, felis, and they feed on a variety of uh, carnivores. They are a vector of murine typhus and the intermediate hosts for dog tapeworm. So if your cat is a cat flea and while grooming themselves, they swallow the, the flea, then that's a good way for them to pick up the, the tapeworm. There's also Pulex irritans, which is, is the human flea. They hide in bedding and upholstered furniture. There's a uh, Xenopsila chiopsis, which is the oriental rat flea. And they're the primary vector for urban plague. And then Aeropsila montana, which is the primary sylvatic or a wild vector for a plague in the Western US. And its main host is the uh, California ground squirrel, Otospermophilus beachii. It's important to remember that if the if their host dies, then the fleas are going to look for the nearest warm body or nearest host. And is that you? If you're controlling rodents, you should also consider flea control. So in households, launder pet bedding or vacuum or apply insecticidal treatments on the animal and environment. Label according to the label, of course. And then outside, do not camp near rodent burrows or play with rodents, etc. Avoid sick or dying rodents because of their flea load. Okay, let's go on to spiders now. You should know the common names. All spiders are venomous, but not uh, many species aren't harmful to man. And black widows have a distinct hourglass shaped like figure on their abdomen. Sometimes, not all the time. Young ones especially may, may be lacking in that uh, the hourglass figure. But the way to tell it's a black widow by more than anything is black widows have an incredibly strong web. And no, don't stick your finger in there to test it, but you can use a stick. And uh, the, the web is also very uh, unorganized. And so you have, you know, whereas an orb weaver have a very distinct geometric web Black widows seem to just go put their webs every which way they want. There's also brown recluse spiders. Other uh, Loxosceles species are found in California, but not the brown recluse. I include these guys because it's entirely possible that one could be shipped in a box from, say, Texas or Georgia or something like that. Um, the venom is uh, very strong and uh, can lead to necrotic anachronism. Tarantulas are native to California. We have quite, a, we have at least a couple of species. Uh, they're very intimidating, but generally passive. 
And most spider bites occur from accidental contact. So spiders hiding in gloves, shoes, etc. So if you have gloves or shoes in the garage, for instance, or it's probably good practice anyway, shake out your shoes and check your gloves before wearing because you don't want to stick your fingers, or your toes into a shoe that quite possibly has a, has a spider in it. One time I found a uh, black widow in my soccer cleat, so it can happen. And finally, let's go over scorpions here. Do you know the scientific names of scorpions? Like most arthropods, scorpions have four pairs of legs, and they notable for the claws and tail. The species of, of most medical concern to man, Centroides, occurs in western New Mexico, Arizona, and adjacent Mexico, and along the Cal Colorado River in California. The species can crawl up into recreational vehicles, boats, trailers, and bedding, etc., and are easily transported from the desert to urban environment. Centroides has been uh, reported in increasing frequency in Los Angeles, Riverside, San Bernardino, and Orange counties. Since human exposure to scorpion stings is the greatest during the spring breeding season, preventative measures initiated before or during that time can be effective. So outside dwellings, get rid of harbor such as rock piles, debris, lumber, and firewood. It's always best to move those away from, from uh, living quarters. And even though this isn't category D, it makes sense to move that kind of debris away because you also don't want to create harborage for snakes, particularly rattlesnakes. Inside dwellings, minimize access into homes by weather stripping, seal all cracks and crevices in the exterior, particularly those near ground level. And again, shake out shoes, gloves, and clothes. Okay, mites. You should know the common names. If you're controlling rodents in a structure, you should also consider conducting mite control. So tropical rat mites are blood feeders and will feed on humans in the absence of rodents. They cannot persist uh, without the presence of rodents, but they will bite you. So you know the disease, disease uh, significance of scabies, how it's transferred and treatment options. And ticks. Know the scientific names. You should know that they're ectoparasites capable of transmitting the causative agents of Lyme disease, tick-borne relapsing fever, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, etc. Nymphs and adult ticks have eight legs. Larval ticks have six. And there are two broad divisions of ticks. So the hard ticks, which are the exerted ticks, and the soft ticks, which are argacid ticks. Here's a chart my colleague Ann Kemtrup uh, made for her presentations, and I borrowed it from mine. So you see exoded and orgasid ticks. The exoded ticks are the hard ticks that you basically see in the grass and you'll commonly find in your dog. The orgasid ticks are rodent, they live in rodent nests and they look more like a raisin with legs. So not really quite what you think of when you think of the conventional tick. So the exoded tick will attached and feed between two and five days. And that's the classic feeding pattern everybody thinks of. But then the argacid ticks, they'll only feed on you for five or 20 minutes, somewhere in there. And once they're done, they'll scuttle back to whatever crack or crevice they came from and they'll hang out there until the next meal. The exoded ticks quest, uh, quest uh, passively on vegetation, whereas the argacid uh, lives in rodent nests and actively sees, seeks hosts. The exoted, uh, each uh, stage takes a single blood meal, while the auric acid takes multiple blood meals. The lifespan of an exoted tick rarely exceeds two years, and the auric acid can live up to 10 years and over 10 years in some, some sources unfed, so they can live a long, long time. So if you get rid of the rodents in a structure, for instance, you should also think about treating for ticks. Here's a picture of Ornithodorus hermsi, which is a soft tick in California. And you can see what I mean by it uh, looks kind of like a raisin. If you compare it to the hard tick on the Exodes pacificus, it doesn't have the, the scutum or the hard shield-like object on, on the thorax and the abdomen. 
There are over uh, 50 species of ticks known to occur in California. Five of the species of exoded ticks are known to bite humans. So there's the genus Dermacenter, so Dermacenter variabilis, they transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There's also Rhyphocephalus sanguineus, which is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and tick typhus. Dermacenter occidentalis, is Rocky Mountain spotted fever and tularemia. Exodes pacificus, well, vector of Lyme disease. And Dermacenter andersoni, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Q fever, and tularemia. Soft ticks, Ornithodurus hermsi, that I showed you picked up before, they vector Borrelia hermsii, which is the causative agent of tick-borne tick -borne relapse and fever. There's also the Pajuelo tick, which is Ornithodurus coriaceus, which will feed upon humans, deer, cattle, etc., and transmit epizootic bovine abortion to cattle. Lyme disease is vectored uh, by the exodes. Uh, Exodes pacificus in California. It's the most common arthropod borne disease in the United States. In 2018, there were 24,000 cases in the US. And 2020, we had 106 cases probable and confirmed in California. So, this is a map of Lyme disease. So, in each county for each case, a blue dot was assigned randomly. So you can see that in California, we've had a smattering of, of cases, not many, but compare that to the New England area and up near the Great Lakes. And you can see that uh, Lyme disease, while more or less infrequent here is exceedingly common back East. Part of the reason why we don't have as much of a problem with Lyme disease, not only the, the habitat or the environment of California being hot and dry, but we also have the presence of Western fence lizards and alligator lizards. So nymphal ticks feed on lizards and these lizards have a borreliocidal protein in, that, in their blood that kills the Lyme disease spirochete, which is called zooprophylaxis. We're examined the pro, uh, proportion of uh, infected uh, adult ticks in California is far lower than in the Northeast USA, an average of one to 2%, while nymphal pacificus infection uh, can be greater up to 10 to 30%. So personal protection, no areas where, where ticks are found. So nymphal ticks are often found in leaf litter, you know, on trees, logs, picnic benches, and hardwood forests. So if you're going out in the woods, uh, particularly in uh, anything below 4,000 feet. Think twice about sitting on some of the logs there because uh, that's often where the, the nymphs hang out. We do tick flagging at CDPH and we take flags and we kind of either kind of scrub them across logs or drape them over logs and pat, pat the flag down on the log. And oftentimes we'll come away with one or more nymphs from the logs. You should all, if you're out working or hiking, recreating, you should uh, wear light colored clothes, wear a long hat, long sleeve shirt, and long pants, and uh, tuck your shirt into pants, pants into boots or socks. Because once the tick gets on you, it starts climbing upward. And if you have a shirt that's actually hanging loose, it could crawl right up under your shirt, onto your, your chest. Now, just because a tick bites you doesn't actually mean you're going to get whatever disease is that it could vector. The tick has to be attached, attached to you for a while. So Lyme disease, between 24 and 48 hours. Verilichiosis, it's about 24 hours. Babesiosis, 24 to 48. And rocky amount of spotted fever, 24 hours or less. So the faster you can remove the tick from your body, the, the better off you'll be. You can also use tick repellents. So if you treat clothing with permethrin repellent, spray your socks, your boots, your lower parts of your pants. You can also apply DEET repellent to uh, skin that's not covered by clothing. So the possible uh, methods for tick management is landscape management, 
host exclusion and area application of the carousides, as long as you read the label first. And that's all I have for you. So 